Hello. In this lecture, we will be discussing polynomials. We'll begin with the definition and basic terminology, specifically what is the degree and leading coefficient of a polynomial. We will discuss domain and range of polynomials, the zeros of a polynomial and how it represents factoring. We'll also include discussion of the multiplicity of a zero of a polynomial, what that means, and how you can construct a polynomial from prescribed lists of zeros with multiplicities. We'll talk about graphs of polynomials, how multiplicities of zeros relate to the graphs and what end behavior of polynomials looks like, and we will conclude with solving polynomial inequalities. So remember that a linear function is of the form f of x equals mx plus b, and a quadratic function has the form f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c. This is the slope-intercept form of a line and the standard form of a parabola respectively. They're both examples of polynomials. A polynomial function is some function of the form f of x equals a sub n times x to the n plus a sub n minus 1 times x to the n minus 1 plus, and you keep adding various terms where your a sub somethings are just constants, they're just numbers, observe that this n minus 1 is the subscript of a. It doesn't really represent this number minus 1. This is just a number whose index is called n. It corresponds to the number multiplying x to the n. This is some number whose index is n minus 1, but it could be completely different from this number here. It just represents the number multiplying x to the n minus 1 power. So if n, for example, was 6, this would just be some number times x to the 6th, plus some other number times x to the 5th, plus so forth and so forth, all the way down to a sub 1 times x to the first, plus a sub zero. And you can interpret this as a subscript zero, which is just some number, times x to the zero, where x to the zero can be taken to be equal to one. So n is bigger than or equal to zero and an integer, and these a's are just numbers, they are constants. Now n is called the degree of the polynomial. It is the highest exponent that appears in that expression above. And a sub n, the number multiplying x to the n, is called the leading coefficient. So it's the coefficient of the highest power of x. Now, if n happens to be equal to 0, then none of these terms really exist. Only this one does. So you have f of x equals just a number. f of x equals c for some constant c. These are referred to as constant functions. Polynomials with small degree have special names. Degree 1 polynomials, where the largest power of x is x to the first, we've seen those. Those are called linear functions. If the highest power of x is x to the second, or x squared, but you might have an x to the first and you could have a constant term, we've seen those. Those are called quadratics. If you go up to x cubed, they're called cubic functions. There are a few more names that get used after this point, but they're less common. x to the fourth would be called a quartic polynomial. x to the fifth is a quintic polynomial. Quintic polynomials have special application and interest in a field called abstract algebra. Past that point, they're rarely referred to by any special name. Let's look at an example by identifying the degree and leading coefficient of a few different polynomials. So first, f of x equals 2x minus 3. Now the degree refers to the highest power of x, and the leading coefficient is the number multiplying the highest power. So the highest power of x in this expression is just x, or x to the first, and x to the first is being multiplied by 2. So the degree is 1, that x to the first power, and the leading coefficient, the number multiplying x to the first, is 2. How about g of x equals negative 4x squared plus x? And again, to find the degree, ask what is the highest power of the variable x? And for the leading coefficient, what's the number multiplying that highest power? So the degree is 2, the highest power we see on the variable is the second power, and the number multiplying that term is negative 4. How about h of x equals x to the fifth minus x cubed plus x squared minus 7? So the highest power was x to the fifth, the power is 5, that's the degree. And what number is multiplying x to the fifth? Well, there's implicitly a 1 multiplying it, so the leading coefficient is 1. k of x equals 4x cubed times x squared plus 1 squared. Now the degree will be the highest power of x, and the leading coefficient is the number multiplying that highest power of x. But k of x is a product of a bunch of various terms. So to find the degree and leading coefficient, we can expand all of this out. 
So 4x cubed times x squared plus 1 squared. x squared plus 1 squared simply means x squared plus 1 times itself. Resolving that product of two parenthetical terms is an x to the 4th plus 2x squared plus 1. And now we distribute and we get 4x to the 7th plus 8x to the 5th plus 4x cubed. So now we can answer the question, what's the degree, the highest power, and what's the leading coefficient, the number multiplying it? So the degree is 7, that's the highest power of x we see, and the leading coefficient is 4. I would remark, going back to this expression here, you don't actually have to go through the work of expanding the whole thing out if all you care about is the degree and leading coefficient. Here, inside the parentheses, the highest power of x is x to the second, but it's being squared. So if you resolve this product right here, you're going to have an x squared squared and various other terms whose power of x is smaller. So just in this term here, the highest power of x you're going to get is x to the fourth. And we saw that here. If you expand this out, the highest power you see is x to the fourth. So just looking for the highest power of x, this term here is going to have an x to the fourth. Multiply it by 4x cubed, you'll get a 4x to the seventh and a bunch of smaller power terms, which is what we have, 4x to the seventh and a bunch of smaller power terms. But if all you care about is degree and leading coefficient, you don't actually need the information of what these smaller powers are and what they're being multiplied by. You only need to know the highest power is seven and the mul number multiplying it is four. So from the beginning of the problem, we could have said, x squared squared is gonna give me an x to the fourth and then multiply by this, we'll have a four x to the seventh plus a bunch of other terms of smaller degree that we don't care about for this problem, and we would have immediately known that the degree was 7 and the leading coefficient was 4. Let's talk about the domain and range of polynomials. So a polynomial is just x's raised to various positive powers multiplied by numbers and adding up all those terms. There's no restriction on what numbers you can do this with because there is no division or anything else like that. So the domain of a polynomial is always all real numbers. If you want to write it as an interval, it's from minus infinity to infinity, and we never include the infinities in our intervals. Now the range of a polynomial isn't quite so simple. It depends on the degree. In general, if the degree of a polynomial is odd, the range will be all real numbers. That is a fact, it will always be true. However, if f of x is a constant polynomial, in other words, its degree is zero, the highest power of x is x to the zero in there, then the range is just that constant. f of x equals seven, for example, is always equal to seven, and it's never equal to anything else. So if you have a degree zero polynomial, the range is just one single number. But if you have a polynomial whose degree is even, but positive, so not degree zero, then the range of f of x will not be all real numbers. Instead, the range will be an interval either from minus infinity up to and including some maximum value a, or for some minimum value a, which is included going up to positive infinity. So for example, look at the function f of x equals 2x squared minus 6x minus 8. This is a quadratic function, a degree 2 polynomial. We know how to find the vertex. So it having been given as a x squared, b x, and c, we know that the vertex is at minus b over 2a. This simplifies down to just 3 over 2, and the y coordinate of the vertex will be f of 3 over 2, which if you compute it will be minus 25 halves. Now we have a parabola whose leading coefficient is positive, therefore it is concave up, it opens up. So the graph of the function is shown at the right. We know the vertex is at 3 halves comma minus 25 halves. If you found the zeros, you could find them to be negative 1, 0, and 4, 0, which isn't really relevant for what we're about to discuss, but it's a concave up. It opens up parabola, so the vertex represents a minimum. Therefore, the range, the possible y values, goes down to minus 25 halves, which is actually in the range. It is achieved, but nothing lower but it will include every y value higher. So the range goes from minus 25 halves, which is included, to plus infinity. Now suppose that f of x is some polynomial. If you can find a number r, so that plugging r into the function produces f of r equals zero, that's called a zero of the function, also called a root or an x-intercept. So to find zeros of polynomials, you want to know when is f of something equal to zero, so you set f of x equal to zero and try to solve for x. For example, 
suppose we have f of x equals minus 3x plus 7. Observe that f of 7 thirds would be negative 3 times 7 thirds plus 7. Well, negative 3 times 7 thirds, the 3 cancels, you just get minus 7, minus 7 plus 7 is 0. So 7 thirds is a 0 or a root or an x-intercept, which you could have found by simply setting minus 3x plus 7 equals 0 and solving for x. What about g of x equals x squared minus 15? Now there are two different zeros of the polynomial. g of root 15 would be root 15 squared minus 15, or 15 minus 15, which is 0. However, g of minus root 15, now if you take minus root 15 and square it, a negative number squared will be the same thing as if you had the positive version of the square root and squared it. So g of minus root 15 will be 15 minus 15 or also zero. There are two different real numbers that are zeros. So we have both of these zeros or roots or x-intercepts. And again, you could find them by beginning with x squared minus 15 equals zero and solving for x. Now here's another example. Consider h of x equals four times x plus five times x minus six times x plus seven. And then let's set h of x equal to zero. Now in order for the product of a bunch of numbers to be zero, in other words, four times this parenthetical number times this parenthetical number times this parenthetical number is equal to zero. So I have a product of four distinct numbers, four, x plus five, x minus six, x plus 7, the product of all of them is 0. How can the product of a bunch of numbers be 0? One of those numbers must have been 0. So either 4 is 0, or x plus 5 is 0, or x minus 6 is 0, or x plus 7 is 0. Now 4 isn't 0, so that isn't going to happen. But could x plus 5 equal 0? Sure, if x equals minus 5. Could x minus 6 equal 0? Absolutely, if x equals 6 and if x equals minus 7, then x plus 7 would equal 0. So what we have found is that there are three zeros to this polynomial. x equals minus 5, x equals 6, and x equals minus 7. Now zeros of a polynomial are absolutely related to factors. In this problem, we had a bunch of factors of a polynomial, and they gave us the zeros straight away. So a polynomial can be written in a general expanded form. This is how we're most used to seeing them, and it's how the definition was given at the beginning of the lecture. We have a bunch of powers of x, where those powers are positive integers, multiplied by some numbers, and then add up those various terms. But they can also be written in factored form. So g of x had factors x minus root 15, x plus root 15. If you expand that out, you'll get exactly x squared minus 15. And the h of x from this slide is exactly what was given here. 4 times x plus 5 times x minus 6 times x plus 7, if you expand it out, will be 4x cubed plus 24x squared minus 148x minus 840. So in general, when you have a polynomial, a zero of the polynomial exactly corresponds to a factor. So if r is a zero of the polynomial, then x minus r is a factor and vice versa. Now, if that factor, x minus r, occurs multiple times as a factor, then you say that r is a zero of that multiplicity, where the multiplicity is how many times the factor x minus r occurs. Let's look at an example. We've just declared that if x minus r occurs m times as a factor of f of x, then r is called a zero of multiplicity m. So let's look at the example f of x given as a fully factored polynomial here, x plus 10 cubed times x minus 4 squared times x minus 1 times x to the sixth. What are the zeros of this polynomial? Now, the zeros of a polynomial r exactly correspond to factors x minus r. So we have factors here, x plus 10. If I was to write this as x minus r, what would r be? x minus 4. If I was to write this as x minus r, what would r be? x minus 1. If I was to write this as x minus r, what would r be? And x by itself, if I was to write as x minus r, what would r be? Well, x plus 10 would correspond to x minus minus 10. How many times does it occur as a root? Well, it's given there three times because it is being cubed. So I have x plus 10 times x plus 10 times x plus 10. In other words, x minus minus 10 occurs three times. So negative 10 is a root of multiplicity three. From the second term, we see that four 
is a root of multiplicity 2. From the third term, 1 is a root of multiplicity 1. And what about that last term, x? What root does that correspond to? Well, x is the same thing as x minus 0. So x minus 0 occurs 6 times, so 0 is a root of multiplicity 6. Here's another example the other way. Suppose we want to write down a polynomial. We want it to have degree 5, and it should have the following roots. 12 is a root of multiplicity 1, minus 3 is a root of multiplicity 2, and 1 half is a root of multiplicity 2. Now, there are infinitely many different correct answers, but here is a pretty straightforward way to do it. Here's one possible polynomial. Since 12 is supposed to be a root with multiplicity 1, x minus 12 should appear as a factor once. Since minus 3 is a root of multiplicity 2, x minus minus 3, or x plus 3, should be a root twice, so I would have x plus 3 squared. And since 1 half is a root of multiplicity 2, x minus 1 half should occur twice. So now we have x minus 12 times x plus 3 squared times x minus 1 half squared. If you were to expand all of this out, you would have a polynomial, you would have a bunch of powers of x multiplied by numbers added together. What would the degree be? Here, I just get an x. This term, if I expand it out, would give me an x squared plus some smaller degree terms. This would give me an x squared plus some smaller degree terms. So only focusing on the largest powers, I have an x to the first. This would give me an x squared. This would give me an x squared. Only focusing on the largest powers, I would have an x times x squared times x squared. So only focusing on the largest power, I'll find an x to the fifth. I have a degree five polynomial as desired. Now, how can I get a different polynomial of degree five with these roots? Since we cannot change the roots they were given, I can't change these factors. The multiplicity was given, so I can't change these powers. The degree is five, and we already have an x to the fifth here, so I can't add in another factor of x minus something. That would introduce higher powers of x, that would change the degree. The only thing we can do here to maintain the same roots with the same multiplicities and the same overall degree is to multiply by a fixed constant. So I can multiply by something, but not a new x, just multiply by a number. That will change the leading coefficient. So for example, we could do any of the following. I could take the expression above and multiply the entire thing by three. Observe, we have not changed any roots. Because three cannot equal zero, for this product to equal zero, I must have either x is 12 or minus three or one half, and I have x equals minus three as a root with multiplicity two, x equals one half as a root with multiplicity two, x equals 12 as a root with multiplicity one. So I haven't changed any of the given information. But I could have also multiplied by something like minus two-fifths. That will not change roots or multiplicities. What it will do is change the leading coefficient. If you expand out all of this, ignoring the three, as discussed before, the highest power of x you're going to get is an x to the seventh. Now in this expression here, you'll simply get x to the seventh multiplied by one. You'll get an x times x squared times x squared, x to the fifth times one. Here, you'll get the same x to the fifth times three. So you have changed the leading coefficient by multiplying everything by 3. And over here, you'll have x to the fifth with leading coefficient negative 2 fifths. So let's build on that last example. We have the same roots with the same multiplicity, and we want a degree 5 polynomial, but we're going to add something in. We want the graph to contain the point 0, 54. So from the previous example, we know we want this factored form times an unknown constant a. Any constant a I put here will match this list of degrees with multiplicity and will keep me as a degree five polynomial. But what about this information that it must go through the point zero comma 54? So it, what we do is we plug in x equals zero and that will allow us to solve for a. If we plug in x equals zero, so I have a, which I don't know the value of, times zero minus 12 times zero plus three squared times zero minus one half squared, f of 0 should be 54 because the graph contains the point 0 comma 54. So now what we just have is we have minus 12 times 3 squared times minus 1 half squared. That works out to be negative 27 times a, and on the right we still have the 54. Dividing by negative 27 tells us that a must equal minus 2.
and therefore the only polynomial that has the given roots with given multiplicities is of degree 5 and goes through the point 0, 54 is exactly negative 2 times x minus 12 times x plus 3 squared times x minus 1 half squared. Suppose r is a 0 of f of x. In other words, it's a root or an x-intercept, f of r equals 0. Then the graph of x can do one of two things. It might cross the x-axis at x equals r, or it will just touch the x-axis and bounce back to the same side it had been on. The multiplicity of r tells us whether it crosses the axis or just touches the axis at a given root. Specifically, if r is a root of odd multiplicity, then the graph will cross the axis at that root. But if the multiplicity of a root is even, it will simply touch the axis at that point. So what we mean by crossing versus touching, odd multiplicity means the function crosses the axis, it goes from negative to positive with a root in between, or from positive to negative with a root in between. But if you have even multiplicity, you will go from positive to positive by just glancing off the axis or negative to negative. Let's take a look at an example. Here is a graph of a polynomial f of x. This is a specific polynomial that was fed into a graphing program. Let's try to figure out a possible equation for f of x based on some information that we can read off. We're going to focus specifically on intercepts of the graph. So observe that we have an intercept of negative 2 comma 0 where the graph crosses the axis from which we conclude that negative 2 is a root, it's a 0, but because the graph crossed, it has odd multiplicity. We also see that we have a root here at x equals 3, but the graph does not cross the axis, it merely glances off it. Therefore, x equals 3 must be a 0 of even multiplicity. We can also read off this intercept of 0, 4. So y equals 4 is the y-intercept. Therefore, f of 0 equals 4. So we've determined from the previous graph that we had a 0 of odd multiplicity at x equals minus 2, a 0 of even multiplicity at x equals 3. Also, we have a y-intercept of y equals 4. In other words, f of 0 equals 4. So because we have that knowledge of zeros and their multiplicity, we should have negative 2 being a root of odd multiplicity, so we're going to pick the simplest odd multiplicity we can, 1. x equals 3 is a root of even multiplicity, so let's pick the smallest positive even number we can, 2, as its exponent, and we're multiplying by an unknown constant. So to solve for this unknown constant, we're going to use the knowledge that f of 0 equals 4. So since f of 0 equals 4, we plug in x equals 0, where a is still unknown. 0 plus 2 is simply 2. 0 minus 3 is just minus 3, but when I square it, I get 9. In other words, 18 times a equals 4, so a should equal 2 ninths. We therefore conclude that a reasonable equation for f of x is f of x equals 2 ninths times x plus 2 times x minus 3 squared. Now earlier, we knew that this factor had a odd multiplicity and we picked multiplicity 1. Here we knew that this factor had an even multiplicity and we picked multiplicity 2. If we were given that the polynomial had to have degree 3, then that would be the only option. If, however, we had something like the polynomial of degree 5, I could have put a 3 here and a 2 there, or a 1 here and a 4 there, and I still would have maintained the overall degree and the multiplicities being even or odd of each root that we found. So this is why we've simply said that we have a reasonable equation. Absent other information to lock it down for us, we simply went with the smallest powers that matched the information we had, because why not make our life easier by using the smallest power we can if there is no reason to suggest otherwise. Let's talk about end behavior. So again, end behavior refers to what happens to a function as x goes all the way to the right or left, in other words, as x goes to infinity or minus infinity. End behavior of a polynomial depends on the degree of the function f of x, as well as the sign, in other words, positive or negative, of the leading coefficient. So there are four possible cases. Here we're going to put them in a little quadrant chart. Suppose you have even degree with positive leading coefficient. So here's the set of coordinate axes. 
as x goes to minus infinity, f of x goes to plus infinity. Now, why is this? As x is a very, very large negative number, it's being raised to an even power. So it's being squared or raised to the fourth. And if you take a negative number and raise it to an even power, you get a positive number, and it's then multiplied by a positive number. So as x goes very, very negative, raised to an even power and multiplied by a positive number, I'm getting out very large positive numbers. But also, if x is positive and I raise it to an even power and multiply by a positive number, that's also going to be a large positive number. So what we see, if I have an even degree polynomial with a positive leading coefficient, to the left and right, the end behavior is for the function to go to infinity. For example, y equals x squared. Here we have even degree, 2 with positive coefficient one. And your generic upward opening parabola goes up in both directions. Suppose the degree is odd and the leading coefficient is positive. Well now, suppose that x goes to minus infinity. I have a very, very large negative number for x. If I raise it to an odd power, so I have a negative number to the first or a negative number cubed and so forth, that will be negative. Multiply it by a positive number, still negative. So as x gets very, very large and negative, y will be very large and negative as well. But if I took a very large positive number and raised it to an odd power, I'd be positive. Multiply by a positive number, still positive. So here we see if the degree is odd and the leading coefficient is positive, I go down to the left but up to the right. For example, y equals x. Degree is 1, x to the first power. Leading coefficient is 1. I have 1 times x. And the graph of y equals x is just a line that goes down to the left and up to the right. Now we can kind of flip things. Suppose we have even degree but negative leading coefficient. The same thought applies where if I go to the left or the right and I have a large positive or negative number, if I raise it to an even power, that will be positive. But now I'm multiplying by a leading coefficient, which is negative, which means in both directions, we're going to go to minus infinity. In both directions, x to the n would be positive and very large, but it's being multiplied by a negative leading coefficient now. So for example, a downward opening parabola is of even degree with negative leading coefficient, and it goes down in both directions. Now what if n is odd and a n is negative? So looking at the upper right quadrant, we're just going to flip everything because we're multiplying by a negative number. So if x is very large and negative, I raise it to an odd power, I'm very large and negative, but now I multiply by a negative leading coefficient and that will make it positive. But if x is very large and positive, I raise it to an odd power, that's positive, but I multiply by a negative leading coefficient, the net result will be negative. So an example here would be something like y equals minus x. The degree is 1, the leading coefficient is minus 1, and it's just a line that goes up to the left and down to the right. So let's work through an example where we're given a polynomial and we're going to use the zeros plus their multiplicities and end behavior to draw a pretty reasonable graph without the use of any technology whatsoever. List all the zeros and mark off their multiplicities. That determines whether the graph crosses or touches the x-axis at each zero. Then use the zeros and end behavior to sketch a reasonable graph. Now it's important here that you know all of the zeros. So you need the function to be fully factored so that you explicitly have all of the zeros here. So for this particular example, the zeros of g of x, well our first factor is just x, our second factor is x minus 2 squared, and our third factor is x minus 4. So we have x equals 0 with multiplicity 1, x equals 2 with multiplicity 2, and x equals 4 with multiplicity 1. Therefore, the graph of the function at x equals 0, because the multiplicity is odd, the multiplicity is 1, it will cross. At x equals 2, because the multiplicity is even, the multiplicity is 2, it will touch the axis. And at x equals 4, the multiplicity is odd again, and therefore it will cross the axis. Now let's look at the end behavior. Ask yourself, if you expanded this whole thing out, is the degree of the polynomial even or odd, and what is the leading coefficient? Well, here I just have an x, here I'm going to have an x squared, and here I'm just going to have an x. So if I multiply all of this out, only paying attention to the largest power of x, you'll have x times x squared times x, that gives me an x to the fourth, but I have a leading coefficient out here of minus 1. So we have degree 4, which is even and a negative leading coefficient. Thinking back to the previous page, if you have even degree, 
the end behavior is the same in both direction. They're either both up or both down. How do you tell? With leading coefficient negative, it must be down in both directions. So as x goes to minus infinity, the function will go to minus infinity, but also as x goes to plus infinity, the function will go to minus infinity. So we've got the following information. We have a zero of zero with multiplicity one, of two with multiplicity two, and of four with multiplicity one. Therefore, we know the graph crosses at x equals zero, touches at x equals two, and crosses at x equals four. We've also observed that this must be a polynomial of degree four with a negative leading coefficient. So the end behavior is as x goes to plus or minus infinity, the function goes to minus infinity. So plot zeros and end behavior. We have a zero at zero, a zero at two, and a zero at four. The end behavior to the left is to go off to minus infinity. And because I know we have all the zeros here, it's never gonna come up and cross again and go back down because then I would have to have more zeros. These are the only zeros of the function. I mentioned before that it's important you know you have exactly all possible zeros of the function. So since this is all zeros of the function, and I know eventually the graph has to go off to minus infinity on this side, it may as well do so right here. But also to the right, I know I go to minus infinity. Now let's see where we cross versus touch. At x equals zero, we're gonna cross the axis. At x equals two, however, we're just going to touch the axis and then turn back around. And then at x equals four, we're going to cross again. So this is a pretty reasonable graph for the function we started with. What about inequalities involving polynomials? We want to be able to solve things like one polynomial x squared being less than another polynomial, negative x plus 12. Or another example, what about x squared times x plus five less than or equal to nine times x plus five? That's a more complicated example, but it's still an inequality involving a polynomial on each side. Now, as with other kinds of inequalities, the solution is gonna be an interval or a couple of different intervals put together on the number line. There's a few standard steps you can follow to find solutions to problems like these. So we're gonna list through those steps and work through both of these examples. The first step, and this is really quite important, you wanna move everything to one side so that you're comparing a single polynomial to zero. Rather than comparing one polynomial to another polynomial, you wanna flush everything left or flush everything right so that you have a polynomial versus zero. So one of our examples was x squared less than minus x plus 12. If we move everything to the left, we get x squared plus x minus 12 should be less than zero. You can also move everything to the right to have minus x squared minus x plus 12 is bigger than zero, but whatever, pick a side, go with it. So now you're gonna have one of the following inequalities, a polynomial f of x being compared to zero, less than zero, bigger than zero, less than or equal to zero, or bigger than or equal to zero. Why is it so important to have zeros? Okay. Because now we can solve what are the zeros of the function f of x. That's going to be very related to how the function compares to zero if we can find where it is equal to zero. For this example, we're gonna set f of x equal to zero, so we want x squared plus x minus 12 to equal zero. This factors pretty directly as x plus four times x minus three, which is solved when x is minus four or when x is three. We're gonna use the zeros we just found to make what we call a sign chart for the function. So draw a number line and mark off the zeros that you have found. So here's a number line and we found zeros at minus four and positive three. This divides the number line into a couple of intervals, three specifically, from minus infinity to minus four, from minus four to three, and from three to infinity. Now on each interval, because we found all of the roots of the function, all of the zeros, the function can't go back and forth between positive and negative over here because to go from positive to negative, there would be another zero. To go from negative to positive, there would be another zero. So it's either entirely positive over here or entirely negative. Similarly, between the two zeros we found, because there are no other zeros that we didn't find, it can't go up and go negative again. It would have to cross. It can't go negative and then positive. It would have to cross. So it's either entirely positive or entirely negative in between minus four and three. So because we found all of the zeros, we have made intervals where the function remains consistently positive or consistently negative. 
So how am I going to find out whether it's consistently positive or negative on each interval? The most straightforward way to do it is to pick a point in that interval and plug it into the function and see what happens. So you can record whether the function is positive or negative at a single point in each interval, and because it does not change, it must therefore be positive or negative on the entire interval. So let's look at the interval from minus infinity to minus 4. Pick a point in that interval. Now we can't pick minus 4 itself because minus 4 is not included in this interval. Also, we know already if you plug minus 4 into this function, you get out exactly 0. We want to get out something positive or negative. We don't want to find roots. We already did that. So let's plug in minus 5. You can plug in whatever you want as long as it's to the left of minus 4. We plug that in, we get out 8 as a result. Therefore, we got a positive number at x equals minus 5. So on that entire interval from minus infinity to minus 4, the function is always positive. Between minus 4 and 3, pick a value of x. 0 is a pretty straightforward one. Plug it in, get out a minus 12. That's negative. So all the way from minus 4 to 3, the function must remain negative. What about from 3 to infinity? Let's test it at x equals 4. Again, I can't pick x equals 3 exactly. It's not included in the interval, and I already know I'm going to get a 0 there. So pick something bigger than 3, like 4. End up with x equals 8, which is positive. Therefore, the function will be positive from 3 all the way to infinity. So we have a completed sign chart for our function x squared plus x minus 12. To the left of minus 4, it's positive. To the right of 3, it's positive, And in between, it's negative. Now, think back to what our original inequality was. We started with x squared should be less than minus x plus 12. We transformed it to be f of x, x squared plus x minus 12, less than 0. So look at our sign chart. Where is this function less than 0? The intervals where f is negative. Well, that's from minus 4 to 3, not including the endpoints. We know at the endpoint the function is equal to 0, and we wanted it in this problem to be less than 0. So the solution to our original problem is exactly the interval from minus 4 to 3, not including either endpoint. So here's a summary of the steps we did. Flush everything to one side so that you get an inequality of a function f of x, a polynomial, compared specifically to 0 in one of four possible ways. Less than 0, bigger than 0, less than or equal to 0, bigger than or equal to 0. The point of getting a 0 on one side is so that if you find the zeros of f and write it in factored form, you can make a sign chart to exactly predict on what intervals is that function positive versus negative. From there, you can solve the original problem. So let's look at this other example. We want x squared times x plus 5 to be less than or equal to 9 times x plus 5. So we move everything to one side. We're just going to pick the left to get this expression here. Oh, we've got a shared factor of x plus 5. So let's factor it out. So from x squared times x plus 5 minus 9 times x plus 5 equals 0, we're going to factor that x plus 5 to get x squared minus 9 times x plus 5 should equal 0 x squared minus 9 is a difference of two squares, so it factors pretty straightforwardly as x plus 3 times x minus 3. We now have a bunch of things we cannot factor any further. This is fully factored. So we have found the zeros. We have minus 3, plus 3, and minus 5. They are all zeros of multiplicity 1. So we divide the number line into intervals based on those zeros. Now we can test the value of the function at one point from each interval. So to the left of minus 5, let's just pick minus 6. Plugging it into the expression x plus 3 times x minus 3 times x plus 5 would produce minus 27. Therefore, the function is negative all the way from minus infinity up to minus 5. What about in between minus 5 and minus 3? Let's plug in minus 4. We're going to get a positive number. In between minus 3 and positive 3, 0 is a pretty straightforward pick. We'll end up with negative 45, so the function must be negative on that entire interval. And to the right of 3, let's plug in 4. Plugging in 4 would produce a result of 63, so the function must be positive all the way to the right of 3. So here is our completed sign chart for this problem. The original inequality was as presented. x squared times x plus 5 should be less than or equal to 9 times x plus 5. We ended up solving for a certain polynomial being less than or equal to zero, and the sign chart of that polynomial f of x is given above. So where is that polynomial less than or equal to zero? Well, it's negative from minus infinity to minus five and in between plus or minus three. But we also, in this problem, are going to include values where f of x equals zero, which was at minus five, minus three, and three. 
Therefore, the net result is to have the solution be all the x's from minus infinity, which we never include, to minus 5, which we are including in this example because that would produce f of x equals 0 and f of x equals 0 was allowed. Also from minus 3 to 3, and we're including both endpoints for exactly the same reason. Now in the previous problem, we ended up with a sign chart by finding zeros and using test points, but you don't actually have to do any computation at all. Suppose you've gotten to the point in the previous problem where you have marked off all of your roots. You have a certain polynomial you want to find where it's less than or equal to zero. You found its roots, you marked them off here. You don't need to do any computation at all in order to determine on which interval is it positive or negative. Let's look at the end behavior. This polynomial, x plus 3 times x minus 3 times x plus 5. If you were to multiply all this out, you'd have an x times an x times an x. That's x to the third with leading coefficient 1. So the degree is odd, the degree is 3, and the leading coefficient is positive, the leading co coefficient is positive 1. That's all we need here. Because we have an odd degree polynomial with positive leading coefficient, as x goes to minus infinity, f of x goes to minus infinity, and as x goes to infinity, f of x goes to infinity. Therefore, the far left and far right intervals on our sign chart are done. The previous steps, with a fully factored polynomial being compared to zero, marking off those zeros on the number line, looking at end behavior will always tell you what happens on the far left and far right. So in this example, on the far left, we must go to minus infinity, and on the far right, we must go to positive infinity. So on the far left, we have to be negative, and on the far right, we have to be positive. So this step will always tell you what happens on the last and first interval of your sign chart. What about the intermediate pieces? You can plug in points and compute a test value as we did before, but you don't have to. We can use multiplicity of roots to determine if the sign of the function changes or not. Remember, at odd multiplicity roots, the graph crosses the axis. It changes from positive to negative or from negative to positive. But at even multiplicity roots, it touches the axis, meaning it does not change whether it was positive on one side or the other or negative on one side or the other. In this example, all of the roots are of multiplicity 1. Odd multiplicity means the graph crosses, so we can now just move from left to right. We know from end behavior on the far left the graph is negative. Since we have an odd multiplicity root, we cross and become positive. Now at x equals minus 3, we have another odd multiplicity root, so we change from positive to negative. And at x equals positive 3, we have an odd multiplicity root, so we change from negative back to positive, which matches the information we already had. So you can complete the sign chart here without doing any test computation at all by combining knowledge of end behavior, from which you need to know the degree and the leading coefficient being positive or negative, and you combine that with knowing whether each root is of odd or even multiplicity. Here, note, we will have the exact same solution. We want to know where is f of x less than or equal to 0. It's going to be a combination of where it's negative with where it's equal to 0, and we know all of these are points where the function is equal to 0, so you get the exact same solution. What happens when you compose two polynomials? The composition of a polynomial with another polynomial will always be a polynomial. For example, let's look at f of x equals x squared plus x, g of x equals x cubed plus 5, and h of x equals negative 2x plus 3, and let's compute some compositions. f of g of x, g of f of x, h of h of x. f of g of x, remember, you're simply going to take g of x, which is x cubed plus 5, and plug it into f. f of x says, take your input and compute its square, and then add the original input again. But our input is no longer x, our input is x cubed plus 5. So take your input and square it, and then add the original input. And that will all simplify down to x to the 6th plus 11x cubed plus 30. What about b, g of f of x? We're going to take f of x, which is x squared plus x, and plug it into the function g. Now the function g says whatever your input is, cube it, and then add 5. So we're going to take that input of x squared plus x, we're going to cube it, and we're going to add 5, which will eventually simplify down to x to the 6th plus 3x to the 5th plus 3x to the 4th plus x cubed plus 5. Observe, this is not the same thing we got for f of g of x. Function composition, the order really matters. 
What about part C, h of h of x? So take h of x, which was negative 2x plus 3, and plug it into h. What did h do to our input? It multiplied it by negative 2 and then added 3. So take that input, multiply it by negative 2 and add 3. Once you simplify everything down, you'll get 4x minus 3. Let's look at an example of compositions of polynomials where we are given an end result and we want to determine possible polynomials whose composition is the result h. So given h of x, find polynomials f and g so that the composition f of g of x will be h. There are many, many, infinitely many, in fact, possible correct answers, but there is a reasonable simplest solution to each of these. So for h of x, we have 3x minus 4 all to the fourth. Can we find two polynomials so that the composition of the two of them would be this result? A pretty straightforward way to do it would be that the outer function f is take something and raise it to the fourth, and the inner function is 3x minus 4. Each of these are polynomials. x to the fourth is a fourth degree polynomial with leading coefficient 1. 3x minus 4 is a first degree polynomial with leading coefficient 3. And observe, if you compose f of g, you'll take g and you'll plug it into f and you'll get exactly the expression h. This is not the only correct answer, but it is a correct answer. In the second one, h of x is negative 6 times the quantity x plus 1 squared plus 7 times the quantity x plus 1. So a pretty straightforward way to resolve this would be to let g of x be x plus 1. What do you do to that input of x plus 1? You take negative 6 times its squared plus 7 times the input. So our outer function f would be negative 6x squared plus 7x. Whatever the input of f is, you do negative 6 times its squared plus 7 times that input. And what are we inputting? We're inputting g of x, which is x plus 1. Again, not the only correct answer, but a reasonable, simplest possible answer. And what about part c? We have negative 2 thirds times the quantity 5x squared minus 11 fourths all cubed plus 1 eighth. So one way to break this apart as a composition of two functions is to say, on the one hand, I have f of x takes negative 2 thirds times an input cubed plus an eighth, and what is my input? It is the polynomial g of x equals 5x squared minus 11 fourths. 